Welcome to a Programming Languages virtual meetup post-recording for meeting number three of From Mathematics to Generic Programming. In meeting three, we covered chapter seven and chapter three, which I will cover at a very high level and merely point out a couple of highlights that I enjoyed. And then we will hear from Storytime with Stepanov about the only romantic mathematician, according to him, Galois. But first things first, this is the table of contents. In the last meeting, we covered chapters 9 and 2. Note once again that we are following the order that the chapters correspond to the four algorithmic journeys video series. The first algorithmic journey is the spoils of Egyptians, which we are currently in. And in meeting 3, we covered two more chapters, chapter number seven, and then chapter three. So in chapter seven, it was a continuation of the multiplication algorithm that was covered in chapter two. And my favorite highlight of this chapter was where not only is APL mentioned and Ken Iverson's 1979 paper notation as a tool of thought, but there is actually a line of APL, a plus reduction of the array one, two, three, which equals six. And not only is the Turing Award paper for Iverson mentioned, but the Turing Award paper for John Backus is also mentioned. Can we be liberated from the von Neumann style, which mentions the language FP? Link to both of those papers in the description of this video if you're interested in checking them out. After the generic programmification of our multiplication algorithm was done, we moved on to chapter three, which primarily focuses on the sieve of Eratosthenes, an algorithm for finding primes. But at the beginning of chapter three, it goes through some geometric proofs, which are rather cool. The first one that is shown is for oblong numbers that form a rectangle, of which the uh, lower triangular matrix, I guess, of this rectangle uh, also form triangular numbers, which you can very easily compute by doing a plus scan on an iota sequence in APL or another array language. Then it goes on to show nomons, which I'd never heard about, which are just odd numbers. And if you stack these nomons, you get square numbers. Very cool. With that out of the way, we are now going to hear from Stepanov on the most romantic, if not only romantic, of the mathematicians, Galois. And here we come to a nice story. I promised you a story. So everybody asks me, or at least my boss. My boss is the person in the back of the room who lives in the laptop. His name is Dan. So he asked me, what is a group? And I had to tell him what is a group. And he said, why do they call it group? It's not clear. The simple answer, because once upon a time, there was a certain young troublemaker who decided to use word group. And here comes this remarkable story of a person who invented groups, Evariste Galois. And he is indeed the most romantic of mathematicians. Every mathematician talks about Galois. Why? Because you see mathematicians lead very boring lives. <laughs> so they want to convince other people that not all mathematicians are boring. Well, they're not as boring as programmers, but Almost as well. <laughs> but so they all, they all talk about Galois because he's a clear counterexample of a life which was not boring, but it was very short. So let me tell you about Galois. You have to know about Galois. And obviously, he is very much venerated, at least in France. And venerated so much that they made a stamp where they called him both revolutionary and the geometer. So, well, he was a lousy revolutionary, let me tell you. But he was, he was a remarkable young fellow. Uh, he was born, as the stamp says, in 1811, and uh, started his life in a very ordinary, he was the only son of a well-off family. Uh, they sent him to a great high school, maybe the greatest high school in the world, Lycée. Louis Lagan. Any French people here who went there? You know, you didn't go there? Mistake, you should have. <laughs> uh, it's a great high school. You say, how could you say it's the greatest high school in the world? Well, okay. Out of the graduates, you have Molière, Diderot, Robespierre, Pompidou, 
Lebeg, for those of you who know mathematics, Adamar, I could go on forever. Artist, Delacroix, so there is just remarkable school. So he goes to this remarkable school where he starts very well. I mean, the first year when he joins, and it's, the, it's, it's a six-year six year high school. Right? So uh, when he starts, and he starts at the uh, fourth, fourth year, I mean, they count from the other way. So the one is the last year. So he starts at the fourth year because they let him skip two grades because his mother taught him Latin. His mother is a prof proficient Latin scholar, very, very good. Uh, so he knows Latin. He skips two grades, does very well the first year when he's 12. And then he loses interest. He's one of those kids. He loses interest, never does well after he's 12. Sort of fails all classes. His teachers write, you know, this, I'm sure you heard this, oh, very capable but does not apply himself. <laughs> so he never applies himself to anything. Sort of drops to the fairly bottom of the class and always does something except what he is assigned to do. Like he, he gets very much into mathematics, except not the mathematics they teach. They have wonderful mathematics, but he buys some mathematical books, especially he buys a great book on uh, equations by uh, uh, Lagrange and uh, studies it by, by himself, like becomes really proficient, but he doesn't study what he's supposed to do. And then, of course, when he, he needs to apply to, to enter college, he applies for the greatest school at that time in the world, Ecole Polytechnique. The French will say it's still the greatest uh, school in the world. It is a very great school. So he applies for Ecole Polytechnique and fails miserably. Just not accepted. Sort of the greatest mathematician, maybe of his time, fails the exam. By the way, attempts to pass the exam next year, guess what happens? Fails it miserably. So he gets disappointed. So he, he is accepted to a school which now would sound as a good school. He is accepted to a Col Normal Supérieur. And Benoit will say, oh, that's a good school. Not in 1830. It was a lousy teacher's college. It took them about 20 years to turn into a decent school. They were not even called a Col Normal Supérieur. They called the Col Normal, whatever. It was a lousy school. And he stays there for about one year after that. He is expelled for bad behavior. So, I mean, clearly not a great success. He is also gets very involved in all kinds of revolutionary things. And you have to imagine again, let us move back to France in 1830. You see, these are dark years over Europe, the time of the Holy Alliance where England and Russia and Prussia and Austria enforce the status quo, the ancient monarchist feudal regime. France, which was sort of invented the revolution. And just a few years back, they marched through Europe proclaiming liberty, equality, and fraternity. They, of course, thought that the way of spreading liberty, equality, and fraternity is by sending armies. For example, they go all the way to Moscow, burn it, in order to provide Russians with li liberty. Etern <laughs> uh, it's an old idea, guys. Nothing, nothing is new under the sun. So, uh, so they go, establish fraternity, but then people say, we don't want fraternity. We want just to get rid of the French. They start <laughs> supporting their, their bad, tyrannical emperors, and they all unite and go and beat the French and give them back their good old kings. Bourbons come back. So these are dark times. But every young man in France wants what? Liberty, equality, and fraternity. They all really sort of have this flaming idea. And right now in France, they want what? They want cheese and sausage. You know. But at that time, they really believed it. Every few years in France, they had a revolution. For example, in 1830, they had a big revolution, a small revolution. Three days, three glorious days in July 1830, 
there are barricades in Paris. There's always barricades and, you know, women with naked breasts standing with a flag. It's a reference to a famous picture by Delacroix. So, uh, but, you know, they, they, they changed the world. And he's very excited. He wants to stand with the barricade. And he couldn't quite make it because he is a kid. Nobody takes him seriously. So he needs to actually study. But instead of studying, he always gets in trouble. He gets expelled. Then he makes a speech about the king raising the toast new king. In 1830, they get rid of the old bad king and get good new king. But he doesn't like good new king. Louis Philippe, so he, he said, drinks for the king and puts his dagger next to the glass. Well, people interpret it correctly. He's arrested, put in jail for a few days. Then a few months passes by. There's a big demonstration. So what does he do? He gets two pistols and a saber and goes in the front row. What happens? He's arrested and put in jail this time for 10 months. So he's always in trouble. He is not perceived seriously by anyone, even revolutionaries, because he's a crazy kid. He attempts to do mathematics, which he loves. He writes papers, sends them. They are ignored. There are some great mathematicians who look at them and apparently either lose his manuscripts or misplace, like Cauchy liked what he saw, but said, well, you have to rewrite it, and they lost the manuscript. Uh, Poisson reads it and says, this is incomprehensible gibberish. So nobody listens to him. Lonely kid. And then a terrible thing happens. He goes to some party, and there is somebody. What we know, it's again, it's all murky and dark. Some guy says something unkind words about some woman. This is this young romantic kid. What do you do when somebody says unkind words about a woman? You challenge him to a duel right there and then, and he does. So he challenged these guys to a duel. And again, I mean, his experience with fighting is going in front of the demonstration with two pistols and a saber. He is not trained. He doesn't know how to shoot. Uh, so... And then he realizes the next morning is the duel. And he has these great plans. And he writes what is arguably the greatest ever mathematical manuscript. He writes a letter to his friend Chevalier, Auguste Chevalier, where he explains his mathematical program. And then he goes and dies. Well, not right away. It takes him one day to die because the other guy shoots him in the stomach and, you know, in terrible pain. He dies after 24 hours. Uh, a terrible loss. It's, and again, the quote when I say a new star from an uh, un, unimaginable brightness, it's from another great 19th century mathematician, Felix Klein. Right? But everybody sort of from that point sort of Point actually is not 1832. He dies, and nobody pays any attention, and he is buried in a pauper's grave because he's just an anonymous grave. There is nobody cares. Mozart was buried in a pauper's grave, a grave too, so it's, it happens. Uh, Mozart wrote music. Uh, <laughs> but so a wonderful romantic story. But he disappears. Nobody knows about him for another maybe 15 years, less, 13 years, when Louisville, another French mathematician, discovers this letter and some other manuscripts and presents it to the world as one of the greatest mathematical. This is probably the night of May 29th. 1832 might have been the greatest night in the history of mathematics. I mean, there is sort of, in terms of density of what he did, there is nothing quite like that. Now I have to spend a few minutes explaining to you what did he do. Because so far you know that he marched with two pistols and a sword. Yeah. Uh, one of the outstanding problems in mathematics at that time 
was a problem of general solution of a polynomial in radicals. Remember, if you have quadratic equation, there is this formula you learned. Yeah, whatever the formula. And then in 16th century, Italian mathematicians, Tertullian, Cardano, come with solution of cubic and quartic equations. So there is a formula for that. And then there is an outstanding problem. Could you do it for fifth, sixth, seventh? I could go on. Uh, and nobody knows. So Galois applies himself to this problem. Sadly enough, he is not the first to solve it. Another great mathematician who died very, very young, uh, Abel, a Norwegian mathematician who literally starved to death, solved it a few years before Galois. But Galois doesn't just solve this problem. He doesn't just prove that you cannot have general solution and radicals in square roots for equations of degree greater than four. He comes with an algorithm which allows you to establish for which equation of however large degree you could solve it or not solve it. And then, but that's also very minor. He comes basically with all the fundamental concepts of abstract algebra, right? He invents what we call groups. And not just invents groups the way I'm doing them. Now, trivial definition. He sort of d discovers the notions of normal subgroup. I cannot tell you, I mean, it's getting technical. And then he defines the notion of a field, finite field, what we now call in his own a Galois field. So he invents abstract algebra, not bad for a kid. Right? And you know, it's, it's something everybody ponders. What would have happened if the other guy missed? And we do not know. It's sort of, he clearly was a man of extraordinary genius, but maybe nothing would have happened. It's not clear whether he, he was able to lead a normal life and become a professor and publish many, many volumes of work. He, he, was, he was a strange guy. But in any case, uh, this is the only surviving portrait. Uh, we do not know then how close it was. Sort of a wonderful, I think, a wonderful story. And I thought that I should tell you. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for future videos. Also, links to all of my socials and podcasts can be found in the description down below.